welcome back to uh, Alabama Gristmill. We took a little hiatus in this month of uh, June and our month of July. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we took July. a little hi- <laughs> Time we, goes yeah, fast. We, the, hiatus, <laughs> the hiatus was pretty good, but we took a little hiatus in the month of July. We enjoyed the summer, spent some time traveling with the family. But we're back in uh, back in the saddle. They say we got some uh, some more stories about Alabama coming up. Good one and a good one today. But uh, first, uh, we'll welcome. Uh, Donna Causey. Hello. Hello. I'm here. And we're here. We're here back. And uh, one thing I do want to touch on before we get into the story is uh, the patron program's working really well. Really appreciate all our patrons that signed up and joined. We are now getting close to uh, the second goal of 250 patrons, which will uh, call allow us to, uh, or the goal is, the reward for that goal is, or the I guess it's a reward. It's a reward. It's a reward. reward. Uh-huh. Uh, well, for the reward uh, is uh, yeah for get, for meeting the go. Well, it's celebration. <laughs> It's a celebration. <laughs> what it is, we'll send that. We're sending out to all the patrons. We're sending out the first Alabama Footprints book e- ebook to everyone. So you'll get a co- is that sent to your email that you have well, set well, up. We're gonna, and, well, they they were downloaded. Yeah, it's, it's downloaded. I mean, you'll get a you, you'll you get, get a notification. Yeah, you get a notification in, email, in your email, and you can download the Alabama Footprints book, the first version. So we'll be adding a, a new goal here pretty soon because I think we're going to hit this one relatively soon. So you want to get the get in involved on that go ahead and uh, sign up for the patron program at uh and you'll find that alabamapioneers.com on the uh, website you'll see become a patron button but we'll get into the story now i think uh, the story we've talking about it now uh, it was about a fellow named charles hooks yeah I guess you can kind of yeah there are a lot of revolutionary war veterans that are buried in alabama because they got grants of land for their service in alabama when it was opened up and so that's what this story is about today is one of the veterans who settled in Alabama or is buried in Alabama and his family and where he came from. And it's a big family in Alabama today. So it's real interesting. Yeah. Well, let's go ahead and get into that story now. I'll let you go ahead and start it. Okay. And tell us a little bit about Charles Hooks. There are many Revolutionary War soldiers that are buried in Alabama, and most of the stories have been lost over time, as you can imagine. But we are lucky, and we have one story that is really a dramatic one, and it's about Charles Hooks and Mary Hooks Slocum. Charles Hooks is buried about 20 miles from the city of Montgomery in a family burial plot. On his on what we used was used to be his plantation, known as the Old Moton Place on Laurel Hill. His sister was Mary Hook Slocum. She was the wife of L- Lieutenant Ezekiel Slocum, and this is mainly a lot about them. Charles Hooks happened to be about thirteen years old, and it was noted in many books that have been written over time about this incident. And it, kind of dramatizes the type of life that people were living during the Revolutionary War. It starts off with uh, Ezekiel Slocum and Mary Hooks, who were married when they were both about 18, so they were kind of young, and they were in North Carolina at the time. And when Lord Cornwallis set out on his march from Wilmington to conquer Virginia, he happened to stop on the way and had his headquarters at Springbank. Colonel Tarleton, who was under him, his legion also was going along, and it camped at uh, Lieutenant Ezekiel Slocum's house, where his wife and children were left alone. Lieutenant Slocum had a commission under Colonel Washington. He was one of the revolutionaries, and he was in the vicinity scouring the country and watching the movements of the enemy. So he was around, and he come back. He would occasionally come back to the homestead and... Um, but he was out and about with his troops trying to check and see where they were and see what they were up to. This story was written years later by Mrs. Slocum because she had such an, a dramatic experience with the British troops at the time. It had such a strong impact. She could, she constantly would talk about it. And someone decided to put, some of her close friends decided to put it down and publish it. And it's almost verbatim of what happened. The story was written in the Women of the American Revolution, which was published in the 1840s by Elizabeth F. Ellett, who happened to be a friend of her. And it was copied almost verbatim from notes she had taken at the time. So it's a pretty accurate story. Mrs. Slocum stated that around 10 a.m., 
she was at her home at the plantation and sitting out on the piazza and uh, with her, one of her relatives and her child. And she must have been pretty young at the time because she only had one child. Then a splendidly dressed officer, accompanied by two aides, and followed by around 20 troopers, dashed up to where she was sitting. And he raised his cap and bowed and asked if she was the mistress of the house and the plantation. Well, she replied that it belonged to her husband, and he was not home at the time. Of course, he asked, is he a rebel? And she replied, no, sir. He's in the army of his country and fighting our invaders, and he's not a rebel. The people in America at the time took real offense to being called rebels because they considered it their country, and they considered the British were their invaders. So that kind of, her comment kind of depicts what the common feeling was in the area. The officer replied, of course, I I fear we differ in opinion, madam. A friend to his country will be the friend of the king, our master. And she replied that the slaves were the only ones who had masters in this country. His cheeks, of course, grew red, and he turned and talked to one of his aides, and or, but he just finally ordered the men to go ahead and pitch their tents in the orchard off to the right. And he told her that he would take over her plantation and the headquarters would be in her house. Well, she replied, my family consists of only myself, my sister and child, and a few Negroes. We will be your prisoners. And so she was really kind of haughty for a young person. you got to remember, she was still young at this age. As the uh, Tyndale, about 1,100 cavalry men camped on her property, Miss Locum recognized a neighbor who was about, lived about 15 or 20 miles away. The neighbors lived pretty far away at that time with these plantations. But he had um, become, he had joined the British Army and become a traitor, as she felt like, to the American cause. Well, Captain Tarleton ordered the man to scout the area for rebels, and she overheard that. And then she went about the task of preparing for her uninvited guest, and finally a good dinner was set before them, even in spite of who they were. And the party praised her meal, and especially liked the peach brandy. So they got, got into that pretty heavily before the evening was over. And Colonel Tarleton, he asked about where the spirits were where did they get it from. And she said, well, it's from the orchard that your men are camped out on right now. And um, one of the Irish captains said, Colonel, if we conquer this country, is it not to be divided out among us? They were thinking about how they could get profits from it. And the officers of the army replied, well, undoubtedly received large possessions of the conquered American provinces, as it was his response. So they mislocum interposed at that point. Allow me to observe, to observe and prophesy, says she, the only land in these United States which will ever remain in possession of a British officer will measure but six feet by two. <laughs> she really stood up to it in spite of them taking over her house. Carlton said, excuse me, madam, for your sake I regret to say this beautiful plantation will be the seat, the seat of, uh, of uh, the British troops and some of us. And she said, don't trouble me about that. My husband is not a man who would allow a duke or even a king to have a quiet seat upon his ground. So she still was feisty. And about that time, when they were really getting into it, they started hearing some gunfire outside. And rapid volleys were going off. And Colonel Tarleton ordered some of his troops to investigate what was going on. They thought it might have been just some hijinks with the soldiers or something, but... Colonel Tarleton knew that there were some American forces in the area, so he was not real sure about that, especially after Miss Slocum was so feisty with him. She feared, though, that it was her husband returning home because he often came home, and he was going to be caught off guard with all these 1,100 troops camped out in the uh, fields and in the orchard. She secretly ordered one of her slaves to take a bag of corn to the mill, on a, and he would have to go on a road that she knew her husband would be traveling on a little bit later in the day. And so she told him, be sure and warn him about what's going on here. You know, don't he shouldn't come home. Well, the, the slave didn't really rush off real quick. He was kind of scared of all the people that were going on, and all the, so he hung around for a while. And Colonel Totten finally asked, 
you know, he got to wondering if he could get some information from Miss Slocum. So he asked her, he said, do you know of any troops in the area? And of uh, Washington's army, and I, and she replied uh, in another haughty response, I presume it is known to you, replied Mr. Sokum, that the Marquis and Green are in the state. And if you would not, of course, she added and paused a minute, be surprised to call from Lee or your old friend Colonel Washington, who, although a perfect gentleman, is said to have shook your hand. She pointed to a scar left by Washington Saver on Tarleton's head and she said he evidently uh, shook your hand very rudely when you last met. Well, her spirited answer made Tarleton worry even more because she was, you know, she was really standing up to him and he was used to overpowering little women like her around and it was kind of surprised him so he decided the skirmish in the woods he worried that this might be a prelude to an attack so he dashed off the piazza and leaped the fence even to reach his regiment and warn him about it because he didn't want them going off half cocked and not ready for any possible attack coming up out in the woods meanwhile lieutenant slocum with a private named John Heimel and Henry Williams and Mrs. Stokeham's younger brother, Charles Hooks, who was only about 13 years old at the time, were in pursuit of that Tory captain, the neighbor who had uh, joined the British troops, and because he had been out scouting around like Miss Slocum had heard earlier. He ran into Lieutenant Slocum's troops. So they were racing him down the roads and through the woods and heading. The captain was head hightailing it back to camp, trying to get away from him. And Lieutenant Slocum's party didn't know it at the time because they hadn't been warned by the slave at that at that point, and they were racing straight into Tarleton's camp that was on his plantation. And Miss Slocum, sharp-eyed as she was, saw them off in the distance. They were getting kind of close, and she saw the commotion going on. And she realized what was happening when they were about halfway down the road to the house and was scared to death that he was going to be captured. Well, by that time, one of the captain or Tory captain who they were chasing, his horse fell. And it caused the uh, them to stop for a few seconds. And the slave, by this time, had gotten out further down the road. And he jumped out on the side right in front of uh, his master, Lieutenant Slocum, and said, Yeah, hold on, master. The devil's here. And he pointed toward the troops that were out, camped out in the orchard. And the men looked to the left and saw the regiment's camp. And so they just wheeled their horses around. But it was too late. There were some troops that were following behind that, so they were trapped in between it, between the troops on the that were already camped out, the ones that were pursuing him. So he real wheeled the party around again and headed straight for the house. And they jumped the fence amid a shower of balls and cleared the cannon at one leap and scoured across the open field to the northwest into the woods. And they reached the shelter of the woods before their f- pursuers could jump the fence that they had just jumped and get into the enclosure. So they managed to escape. And Tarleton decided not to... He, he had them pursue for a little while as they got near the woods, but he called them back because he was still worried that this was just kind of a prelude to a big attack from Washington, who was on the outside from what the way Miss Slocum had been answering his question. He was convinced they were in real danger. He ordered the trumpets to sound, and the platoon that was chasing Lieutenant Slocum was called back. And he rode to the front of the house, and he called the Tory captain who lived in the area who hadn't managed to escape from Lieutenant Slocum, and he began questioning about the attack in the woods and the names of the American officers that were involved because he knew he'd know them they were, if they were neighbors close by. As Tarleton walked into the house, he told Miss Slocum, "'Your husband made us a short visit, madam. "'I should have been happy to make his acquaintance "'and that of his friend, Mr. Williams.'" Of course, Miss uh, Mrs. Slocum was not deterred. She said, "'I have she she knew his strength.'" She said, "'I have little doubt that you will meet the gentleman, "'and they will thank you for the polite manner "'in which you treat their friends.'" So that made Slocum think a little bit, and he he got a little nicer after that because if Washington's troops were around, they would have definitely been outnumbered. So he was apologetic, and from then on, he kind of treated her with a little bit more kindness and 
and they were able to partake of the peach brandy and coffee and spent the night enjoying that. Anyway, meanwhile, Slocum and his companions returned to the place where they first encountered the British troops, and they collected the stragglers from their party at, that had been left beside on the wayside because they couldn't keep up with them or had been injured. And they discovered the Tory captain who had joined the British brother, and he was hanging from a sapling tree that had been pulled down. And somebody, they, since he'd been captured, they were going to hang him. But he wasn't quite dead yet. And Slocum kind of felt sorry for him, so he cut him down because he, he had been a neighbor. This was an American because he's the brother of the, the traitor who was the British uh, captain. And so he cut him down, and and the story goes, the man lived to a ripe old age in the lower part of North Carolina. His eyes kind of bulged out because he'd been hurt, a lot, I guess, in the hanging. But he, he managed, his life was saved by uh, Lieutenant Stokem and his troops. And Slocum and Major Williams raised about 200 more men in the neighborhood and continued with the Army till the surrender of Yorktown. He, and he made it through the Revolutionary War. He and his wife lived together another 60 years. Her younger brother, though, this is where Alabama comes in, her younger brother, Charles Hooks, was married three times. He went into the legislature in North Carolina, and he served about three or four terms. In, well, three terms in the legislature, and he served four times in Congress. And his last wife he married was Ann Hunter. They moved to Montgomery, Alabama in 1826 when she was around 51 years age. Now, Charles was a bit older at that time, and he died in 1843, and he was 76 years old. And he's, he's buried in the private cemetery of the Moulton family on Laurel Hill, about 14 miles from Montgomery. She died in 1854 at the age of 78, so you can see she was a little, good bit younger, lived a good many years after him. Now, daughter of Charles and Ann Hooks, Catherine Ann Hooks, was born October 31st, 1801, and she married Major Thomas Bolton in North Carolina, and they also moved to Alabama the same year as her parents. And they had a plantation in Montgomery. So that, that line, the hook in the Slocum line, kind of continued on down to Alabama. So we've, they had a really good history. And if luckily, it was written down. So we know pretty much that this is exactly what happened. But it, it kind of gives you an idea about the Revolutionary War that affected us and some of the stories they brought along with them from the past. Well, that's a pretty fascinating story about the Revolutionary War hero, Charles Hooks, and has tie into Alabama and, I guess, some of his backstory as well. So, Right. He, he was only 13 at the time, He, you know, all this took place. So it, he was a, one of those young veterans that served, but he still came to Alabama and started a new life here. So... Well, and the and the lady in the story, uh, what was her name again? Mary was, Hooks, uh, was, uh, his sister. Yeah, she was. She was a, a strong lady. <laughs> she you know, giving was. the warnings and the heads up to you know, and protecting the house and but knowing what's going on while you have basically the enemies in the house as well. And she's so, young too. They were yes. these these were not yo older people who had a lot of mature years. They were young, you newlyweds and. Keeping their sense about them and all is something else. Yeah, to have the wherewithal to do that, at just that a, you know, in your teens. Yeah, in you your know, teens. You know, as a teenager, that's pretty amazing. It is. Well, I'll go ahead and wrap up this uh, episode of Alabama Grist Mill, and we'll have a, another one out later this week. And we'll try to be, you know, now that we're back in the saddle, we'll keep the pace up the Probably one or two a week is what we're looking at. See how that works out. But again, appreciate uh, all the listeners out there, and look forward to look forward to the next episode next time on Alabama Grist Mill. We'll see you later. See you later. Bye bye. Hey,